Welcome to the five eight. To all you who are not out dining at Morton's tonight, I salute you. <laughs> yeah, that's some water. What are yeah. you drinking, Greg Oliar? Um, this is this is a week, man. This is just tequila on the rocks. I'm not <laughs> messing around this week. You're just no. straight going for it straight. <laughs> well, it, there's a little bit of lime in it, you know. Yeah, just a little bit of a little bit of flavor. Um, I have. I'm at my at my sweet friend's home, and she made me this. I don't know what this is. I'm going to try it. Here we go. I don't know what it is. Okay. Here we go. Yerba mate. It's a yerba mate. I just got, I forgot. I forgot. Yeah, because I'm not doing alcohol. You're not doing alcohol. Oh, it's yeah. it actually is very refreshing on ice. I'm switching. Okay. I'm doing that. That's good. We've got a great show tonight. Um, we we've got do. a great guest tonight. Uh, we're excited to bring her on in a little bit. Um, she's an expert in fascism, and you know. That's just we have to talk about fascism I all think the time we need now. That. I know I, it's yeah. a it's an all the time thing. We're in it. We're in the we're in the throes of it. We are in the boom. It is happening. Yeah. I don't have any advice really, but maybe we can you know we can get some out of her, which would be we, wonderful. We can. Before we get started with the, with the actual topics, I the, I'm delighted by this Elon Musk news. Yeah. Like. I mean, I'm not I'm not like a financier. I don't really understand the ins and outs of this, but I yeah. think that he fucked with them and now he has to just pay Twitter like a billion dollars. And they're yeah. gonna take that money and they're gonna sue him to make him give them more money. I think and so. And he's still not gonna own Twitter. Um but I, that that part I don't understand. So they're forcing him to go ahead with the deal. But I think but then like, he owns it. So why are you I don't think it's gonna I think it's one of those things that they're I think it's a negotiation ploy to get more money out of. I think. Maybe I haven't. I don't know. I, again, I don't points. know what I'm yeah. talking about. I'm completely talking out of my ass, <laughs> as if I'm Elon Musk talking about almost anything. Fatherhood. Yeah. yeah. No, he knows a lot about that. I you don't know, know hey, that he does. Elon, take the 44 billion that you don't have to spend on Twitter and get a vasectomy, please. I'm begging you. It's I, time. It's not enough. Be, no be a responsible yeah. middle-aged man. Damn it. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> He's over the hill. I don't think he's middle aged anymore. He's he's old. He's as old as I am. What do you like? He's stop middle-aged. having kids. Yeah. yeah. Nobody nobody needs it. Yeah. 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 But whatever. He can afford it. Um. Oh, okay, before we before we delve into the awful stuff, can I can I make a, a, a show recommendation? Sure. Okay. I've been watching this Irma Vep as, as yeah. you and I have discussed. I love Irma Vep is really good, guys. It's, it's my really, favorite. Really good. I, I can't. I, okay, there you go. We have a special guest. I forgot. Sorry. It was very no. good taste. We can't not be in the conversation. Live. I forgot. I, I, it's, it's so good and it's so not related to anything happening right now. Yeah. Even though they mentioned there's certain things that kind of come and go, but it doesn't matter. It's like almost this parallel universe of art and movie making and yeah. acting and workplace dynamics and it's really funny and cool and what do you think French. about the workplace dynamics since we have a movie star <laughs> what do you think about the workplace dynamics it, it's it's hi um it, it's it's real that's exactly what goes down that's how it is <laughs> it's yeah. funny um, that's how it is it's funny that I character the guy named Gottfried is just are I you can't ahead even. of me you're ahead of me no I it's I'm not to spoil anything by telling you okay. a good character will show up I think you know that's true of almost any show Okay. That's true. Uh, anyway, oh, if you're looking for something to watch, audience, I highly recommend Irma Vep, and so does our resident movie star. So there. There. Yeah. Exactly. If you don't take my word for it, take hers. That's right. Um, is that my yeah. gesturing in the right? Yeah. Not all. yeah. I don't know. I think that's the right direction. I think I'm, I'm just. I don't know my right. left from right on this on this crazy. Okay. Uh, yeah, story. I've never I've never been able to figure it out. So. All right. Listen, okay. I'm starting the timer. That's enough chit chat. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. All right, you're the one. You're starting us off because that that I, I I'm seeing on the scroll it says pincer movement. I I think it's called pincer movement. I don't think it's pince. pince. I think it's. Pince. I don't think it's French. I don't think it's a it's a war term that's French. I think it predates Napoleon and therefore is not French. But it I, might predate him. Okay, so he, yeah. here's what happened, everybody. So I'm you know doom scrolling on the Twitter. This is what we do, and I see. Uh, an account that I'd never seen before. And someone had obviously retweeted it into, so I could see it that I follow. And it was a guy talking about, uh, and I think he's an author or a journalist. I don't know. The problem is after I read what he had to, to uh, what he had to write, cause it was a sub stack or something. I couldn't find him again. So I feel terrible that I can't find this person and give them credit. Um, and maybe, maybe the audience will, 
clue us in. Okay, the yerba mate is giving me a little. Oh. Sorry, everybody. Um, okay. Because it's carbonated. Oh, I'm okay. Are you not supposed to have it? No, it's okay. Okay. Uh, so if, if you if you burp on the show, everyone watching has to drink. Fifth. Oh, we could just say fifth. Yeah, I'll take a drink. Yeah, new rule. Okay. Fifth. Anyway, so a pincer movement, and I'd heard of it battleground wise. So this is a, and I don't know. I, I'm I'm like the worst with military anything, but it's the term on a battleground where you flank from both sides your enemy, right? So. For ground warfare, you come in with that, and then you come here and you squeeze him. I don't know if pincer is like actual squeezing, because that kind of would be a French term. Right? Yeah, it's like a pincer. pincer. A pincer. That's how pincer. I look at it. Yeah, that's how I think of it. And so this author was correlating that to what we're going through um, in terms of you have it happened from whatever country he's from. Uh, and he was saying, this is what happened to us. I need everyone to pay attention. And I guess he's been trying to get folks' attention to this. It's when you have a top down and a bottom up squeezing of a society with a theocracy and with a stripping of rights at the top and terrorism from the bottom, right? From the groundswell of society, from the, the dredges, we're getting terrorized. We're having these mass shooters. We're having the white supremacists and the and, and white nationalists, you know, going for their ethno white state, going in for the insurrection. Just that feeling like you're being terrorized from the ground up right, from the underbelly of our society up, while at the same time, those who are in power are specifically the law, so who are in charge of um, creating our laws and enforcing our laws, so not just law enforcement, but the Supreme Courts, right, or the, or the justice, they're pressing down on us in a terrorist way by stripping us of our rights, uh, by by taking by and by failing to uphold the law for those that are in power. So the people that are in power are beyond the reach of law, like we saw with the Trump administration. And the courts themselves are then not only participate, you know, sort of undermining all of that, while at the same time stripping us of our rights. So that's why we feel like we're in this constant state of trauma, is because we're being squeezed from the top and the bottom excuse me, by this sort of, and terrorized in our societies and our daily rights, and our future is being stolen from us. Um, and our present is being, we just feel like we're being assaulted from every direction. So I wanted to bring this up because then I'm like really into this, right? I, I, oh, I didn't save this guy's article. I can't find it. I, I go back to like, look for it. And I find another article on a pincer movement and then relating it to what America is going through right now. And I'm, oh, okay, here's, this looks like a scholar and I'm reading and I'm getting into it. And I'm like, wait a minute, ah, when was this written? And it was put forward during the Obama administration by one of the guys that Steve Bannon follows, right? His writing. So I was like, oh, or just after it, just after Obama. And I'm like, oh, this is an offensive bullshit strike, right? This is the gaslighting. Now we have the folks that are actually would go forward to this is actually their plan of action is to terrorize us this way, putting out these thought pieces, these sync pieces to help radicalize people into believing that's actually what was happening to them when it wasn't. So that sort of reverse, the, the thing that gaslighters and that abusers and narcissists do a reverse victim an abuser, right? So I want everyone to have their ears tuned and their eyes tuned. If you start seeing people start talking about pincer movement, pincer movement, pincer, 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 really look carefully at that, at who's putting that out there. Usually when I would find stuff like this, it would be being sort of hijacked by and, and used offensively by the alt-right, like when they took Walter Durante and they made a whole big thing about Walter Durante before we realized that we were gonna be in the middle of another big onslaught of propaganda coming out of the New York Times, right? And, and very selective framing uh, from that media outlet. So they're always telling us what they're doing by accusing us of what they, they're planning. Um, so anyway, that was it. I just, I wanted to share that with everybody because I thought it was so fascinating. Um, and I thought it was a very good description of what we actually are dealing with. I like that. And, you know, when you talk about the top down, it's the Senate, you know, certainly. 
Yeah. And it's SCOTUS. And one of the things I, I wanted to bring this up and I wasn't sure where this Brett Kavanaugh thing that happened where I guess Brett Kavanaugh was at Morton's Steakhouse just trying to enjoy a steak dinner that normally he wouldn't have been able to afford with his big <laughs> yeah, and, um, yeah, in the olden that. days, not so long ago. And yeah. uh, I guess there were protesters out front of Morton's who knew he was there and he had to leave before dessert. And this is the worst thing that has ever happened to Brett Kavanaugh. Okay. <sighs> My God, no tiramisu for me. It's just a horror. But I yeah. remembered, okay. I'm Morton's sure he got his drink in though. Oh, oh, I'm sure he had them I'm before, sure during, and after. Plenty you know. lit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like lit up like a Christmas tree. So um Morton Steakhouse is a is, I'm told, a Leonard Leo hangout traditionally. Oh. And Leonard Leo, this is the guy who runs the Federal Society and the Judicial Crisis Network. And I've written a piece on him. If you don't know who, in fact, my pinned tweet is is about Leonard Leo. And um, he is a insidious cancer upon the body politic. He's the guy that basically was the prime mover to take over and capture the Supreme Court successfully. And he's from, you know, he, he he's very conscious of status because he went to some public high school in central New Jersey, which is an embarrassment to me as a New Jersey person. Anyway, Morton's is a place where he used to hang out and bring people all the time. He had his own little section of the wine cellar there where he would show off to people. He's such an onophile. You know, he knows so much about wine. This great genius man. Um, so, and I'm told, I, I would like someone to research how many times Leonard Leo went out to Morton's and charged it to the government when he was the director of that, of that agency, the religious oh. agency back in the day. Um, because I'm guessing it would be not insignificant. And anyway, you know, he's got a taste for it. So Morton's, I mean, it's a chain and all that, but it's also significant. It's overpriced and unoriginal. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with you. Okay, yeah. moving on. I can talk a lot about Morton's. We can, go, we can get into Morton's history, <laughs> but we're not going to do it. Oh, um, ooh, not okay. today. Oh, my God. All right, what moving a on. What a tease. Okay. Um, on. Look, Tucker Carlson's in the news again. And I, I, I know I keep talking about this guy, but I, I feel like we need to keep talking about this guy and reviewing the facts of who he is and where his anger and hatred come from and what he's doing right now, which is just, I don't understand. At a certain point, it's no longer even propaganda. It's, it's, it's almost incitement to do bad things. And it's a fucking national security threat. We're way beyond that with this guy. I mean, he's somebody who was, you know, COVID disinformation all during the pandemic. Um, obviously, election weird stuff at that time. Um, you know, what's the other thing? Uh, Putin apologist. You know, why would we not want to have Russia beat Ukraine? Why am I on Ukraine's side? I'm on Russia's side. Yeah. This is Tucker saying this stuff for months and months and months. Of course, he goes to Hungary. He has a show in Hungary where he's basically fluffs Viktor Orban, mm -hmm. who is a dictator um, yeah. of Hungary. And at least according to uh, the testimony of one of Semyon Mogilevich's lieutenants, a former bagman for the Russian mob. So okay. that's what Tucker's so doing. You're talking about Clodo? Yes. Yeah. And Clodo wasn't necessarily lieutenant. He was uh, tied into terror. Okay. I guess we could call him that. Yeah. I'm using the word colloquially. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Fifth. I don't have a world beneath podcast. I'm not familiar with the, uh, yeah. you know, he's the exact rankings. He's here. a terrorist. So yeah, yeah he's, he's a terrorist, but he did history. testify in a court of law to the fact that Orban did this and Orban yeah. did flip flop. He was kind of a liberal yeah. Democrat. And then he suddenly became this hard right guy. Yeah. Um, Tucker Carlson's there singing this guy's praises, blah, 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 blah. Um, you go back in his past, there's lots of weird shit with the, with him. Like he was friends with the pimp that ran in Nevada and then died and then <laughs> got elected anyway. Why is Tucker Carlson friends with a pimp? I don't know. I don't know any pimps. Do you? No, no. I'm not, I don't know. I don't know that I would want to be friends with a pimp. I'm taking the know. fifth. Uh, <laughs> but this week he's on trying to make excuses for the, the Highland Park shooter, killer, right. slaughterer. Okay. Right. Trying to blame women. Trying right. to blame, oh, this guy probably was bullied and women were mean to him or whatever he said. You know, just crazy ass shit. And 
you have to look back in Tucker's past when Tucker Carlson was six years old. I know everyone likes to talk about the frozen fish air thing, but I think that's deceptive. Okay. Tucker Carlson's real mother, her name was Lisa McNair Lombardi. She was an artist, kind of a bohemian artist from San Francisco. And that's where Tucker was born in 1969. Uh, and his brother Buckley. Uh, so when Tucker is six years old, his mother is just like, I'm out. And she just leaves. She doesn't yeah. even just leave the family or the state. She leaves the country. She goes to France. And there's a lot of history. Like Tucker tries to present this like my mom was, you know, she was kind of crazy and blah, blah, blah. When his mother died, she left. Uh, and she got married again and had a family and everything. When she died, she left Tucker and Buckley one dollar each. And they they sued to, you know, try to get more out of the thing because, you know. Why wouldn't they? It's their mother. But the point is, this lady left. She she looked at six-year-old Tucker and said, e either she said, there's too much bad stuff going on in this house with, the, with my husband. I have to leave. Or she looked at her kid and was like, holy shit, I've given birth to Satan Spawn. I'm out. You know? And um, that's it. And anytime Tucker goes on and on about women, I think it's pretty, you know, it, there's a through line right back to that. You know? Yeah. And it's, I write, the same thing happened to his dad, by the way, who was given up for adoption uh went to this orphanage uh when he was a baby and when he was you know later on his birth mother who was 15 at the time came back and the the father wanted the family to reunite and she looked at dick carlson and was like nah i'm good so this happened to dick carlson and it happened to tucker carlson which is interesting it's like this repeating pattern of thing so i don't know what that means um i don't know what women they have mommy yeah. issues. They have mommy it's not, issues. It's not Look, hard to unpack. My mother loves happening. me. Yeah. I don't know if Tucker can say that. Sorry, Tucker. So that's your propagandist. I don't know why he's doing what he's doing, but he's yeah. coming from a place of real hurt and rage and anger. And I don't even understand anymore what, what he's up to. I don't understand why we let this continue um, with the stuff he's saying. Yeah, I, it's so bad. I think that's Marcus. the key point of like, I, I, there's gotta be, I'm not, it's not that I'm going to float right now that we should regulate speech. It's not about that. It's, I don't know that that's speech. Um, it, why is it, it's, we're allowed to regulate speech if it's, if it's harmful to the public. It, 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 it uh, propaganda needs its own thing. And, and I floated this stuff, what I did float years ago. And I, I think it I think I kind of want to come back to it and look at it because everyone's like, oh, we need the fairness doctrine back and all this. And actually, I think what we need <laughs> is for to to strengthen Farah and yeah, make good. sure that if the propagandists are that they're actually American and they're and they're they're doing what they're doing as Americans for Americans um, instead of, you know, I think it's. I think it's shaky in there. I really do in Fox. And I think in certainly in like Daily Caller and you get into all the people that he floats on Daily Caller and all these voices that he brings up in there. Don't forget, this guy is does have a white nationalist radicalization and platform machine churning underneath him that's separate from Fox with that particular outlet, um, which is digital. Uh, it's like a digital print if, if people don't know what it is. So it's like a Breitbart kind of thing. He, he doesn't um, own it anymore, but he owned it for a long time. And he's obviously he owned it for a long time, but he cultivated all of those yeah. people in there. So uh, the question becomes, you know, when we look at these larger at these larger media platforms and properties like a Fox uh, broadcasting, everything, who do we allow to use the term news? Shouldn't that be? something that's very clearly defined and that gets regulated is the use of the word news on on your platform because maybe it's not news maybe you're not doing news um that needs to be clear but then especially if there's anybody that you're bringing on and you're putting on air or you're putting on like all the people that he brings on to help him with his propaganda a lot of those folks that we see regularly that we know aren't they're they're funded by some some of them by some sanctioned people so why are we allowing that without there being a great big chiron that has to stay on the screen saying 
this person is paid by Turkey to say this shit, right? Yeah. Just so that we have labeling like cigarettes, right? So I, I think the information coming into the space and into the discourse from these big outlets needs that kind of responsibility warning and labeling on it. And if they're not gonna do that, cause they're profiting off of that. Fox profits off that speech. So they're making money off of that. And if it's not disclosed that there's a foreign agent on there, then they're, I think they should be hit with some violations. Well, they're in trouble. If you, that's, start, that's, hit, if you start hitting them in their, in their pocketbook of like, you're now going to pay for this because you didn't register. You yourself now, Fox, has to register. If you're going to carry something without labeling it, then you have to register. And that would stop it. That stopped RT. It did. It, it, it was, that was starting to virally spread. And it really couched that. Uh, appropriately. So it's just like, you just got to register. You got to register, you got to label, you got to say who and what you are. It doesn't belong in small print at the bottom of a, an opinion page on New York Times. It belongs on the top, right? This, art, this is article is uh, benefiting, is propaganda for a foreign national or a foreign state. But even when they say who it is, like in an op-ed, it doesn't say they're a paid representative of Turkey. It says they're a representative of the blah, blah, freedom. Right. In small credit at the bottom. I don't want it there. Yeah. But even that, it's even the be. name of whatever entity it is that they're, it's, it's, he's writing for the national interest. You know, the, the names are all benign and anodyne yeah. and they don't really say who they really are and whether well, you say this, this person had to register uh, FARA, Foreign Agent Registration Act, in order to place this piece in this paper. That would, that would, uh, that would be. That would right. do it. One point also that you made that I think we need to make and, and stress is Rupert Murdoch it has allowed this to go on. Yeah. So when Tucker's there doing his thing. And Lachlan. Um, and La but yeah, they've allowed it. They've countenanced it. So Tucker, yeah. you know, if he's there fluffing Orban, so is Rupert Murdoch. And this is important to know. When Tucker's screaming about how M&Ms are too sexy or Nancy Pelosi shouldn't go to the beach ever again. <laughs> um, th this is, this is uh, you know, this is Rupert Murdoch too. So he's the most important voice at that at that news outlet. And, you know, we have to assume that if, if Rupert Murdoch didn't want it to be on like that, it wouldn't. So, yeah, they want know, this. Yeah, yeah they, they want just like the Republicans in the Senate want gun violence because they right. would stop it if they didn't. They clearly do. Right. And Rupert Murdoch and these guys want this poison lies. to they be want in lies. the discourse. They want yeah. it there. So why? I don't know. I mean, I do know. You know, well, we can guess, but it doesn't matter. It's there. So uh, it's intentional. Yeah, yeah, it's intentional. It's intentional. Um, OK, so we're going <laughs> to we're going to bring in our guest. This is a risque one, LB. It's a risque one. Is it risque? Oh, gosh. Sorry, guys. It, well, it is Friday night. It's it's a little bit risque. So, okay. you know, apologies to anybody that's going to be horribly offended. And I'm going to try to fix a little tech issue while while you're there. So, OK. If right. you if you we come back and I'm not here, I I gravely apologize, but I'm gonna try to fix this. Okay, you go okay. fix it. All right. You're a slave to your desire. You know you'd do anything for me, anything I command. How long can you stand it, bad boy? Not having me in your mouth. Because you know I won't melt in your hand. Tucker Carlson presents The Brown MM less sexy. The new kind of candy from Mars Incorporated world's kinkiest confectioners, s and M's. If you want something delicious, you'd better get on your knees and beg. s and M's. Flavor is the sweetest mistress. s and M's. They're anything but vanilla. The s and M's are available at Victoria's Secret, Walmart, Hobby Lobby, Hooters, and that creepy adult bookstore across the street from the strip mall. Okay, yeah. There you go. You were still standing when it was over. I, was, I, was sorry, sure. I didn't I, want to. I, I didn't want. I'm anyone. having a battery issue, so what I'm going to do is you take me off screen. I'm going to move this setup so that it's for something's wrong with the outlet, and then you'll see me. Then pull me back in there. I'm going to see you pull me back in there. Okay. In the meantime, all right. Bye. But let me say hello. Let me say hello. Okay. To our guest. Yeah, okay. Our guest tonight, okay, is the author of Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, and uh, one of the most important voices. Um, certainly on Twitter and out there now. Uh, Ruth ben Giat. hello. Thanks for joining Ruth! us. Ruth, yay! Hi. Nice to be with you. It's good to see you. How you doing? How you doing in New York? Sweating? Sweating away. <laughs> uh, worrying about 
democracy. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, you've been making the rounds for sure. So, uh, feel free to tell everyone, I'm going to pop off, but tell everyone about that if you will. And, you know, and I just think we were just talking before everybody knows we were sort of, so that we could tell the audience we're doing our little sound check and everything before and talking about how important your voice is and how important it is to just keep repeating this stuff over and over again of what we're going through, what we're living through, what this is, put the put simple words around it. It really is happening. We're not crazy. We're not paranoid. We're not conspiratorial. This is going on. You know, we're facing authoritarianism. We're facing a real fascist takeover and that we just have to sort of calmly keep reminding us, everyone of that so they can get out of denial and really absorb, okay, it really is happening. So um, I wanna hear all your thoughts on that and everything. And I'll, I'll be able to hear you guys in the background, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna fix okay. my tech stuff. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, you're you're up. Um, so yeah, that, that's the real question. Um, where, where do you wanna begin? You wanna begin with, with J6 and the committee or? Yeah, I think, you know, um, the fact that we're having these hearings at all is absolutely stunning. Uh, in many, many countries in the world, you wouldn't be able to have those hearings. And uh, investigators are uh, among the people who are uh, most vulnerable in authoritarian states to being killed. Um, I wrote an essay in my, I have a Substack newsletter called Lucid. Which is very good, wrote, everyone should subscribe, okay. Please subscribe. Um, but I wrote an essay called Lock Them Up, uh, you know, jailing investigators is what authoritarians do. And so the part of the, if, if, if you feel that things are accelerating uh, and becoming and, and the GOP and its allies are becoming way more um, aggressive and intensive. It's part of that is in response to the enormous threat that these hearings represent. These hearings are, you know, calmly and methodically exposing the total criminality of the GOP. Also, the scope of the complicity in the coup attempt, how many people are involved and there's many more things to come uh but it, it can be it can be hard to digest that um the trump wanted to have pence killed that it can seem right out of a political thriller that there was this design to um what you call decapitate or neutralize the uh chain of presidential succession Right, they were supposed to hang Pence or kill him. They were going after Pelosi, calling her name, trying to find her. And then Chuck Grassley uh, tweeted that Pence wouldn't be there, and he was the pro temp tempor uh, president of the Senate. So they had a design which is straight out of the coup playbook. So um, this is very weighty stuff that can seem like it, it, it can't possibly really be happening, but it is. And the fact it's being exposed is huge. Um, in my book, I have a whole series of investigators and people who were murdered by Putin and by Mussolini. So this is very radical in a way what we are hearing on prime time and on television. It seems like the Cassidy Hutchinson um, testimony, for whatever reason, moved the needle a lot more than anything had previously with Republicans. Do you think that's true? And and why do you think that it is, if you do think that it's true? I do think it's true uh, because this is someone, she's, she's young and she was, she had proximity to Meadows. Meadows, you know, every, uh, like a, a third of my book is about coups and I had no idea it was gonna be so relevant to the United States, right? <laughs> And so every coup has a figure like Meadows. Um, he's like the glue, right? He was Trump's chief of staff. So he was, but he was a liaison between all these different people um, and very interesting. And, and it came out uh, that he was, you know, gonna, he, wanted, he didn't go in the end, but he was gonna be meeting with Flynn and Stone who are the, the liaison with, with extremists uh, and military people in Flynn's case. But 
Hutchinson was right there. And so she provided uh, an eyewitness account. For example, when she said, um, well, when the violence started, I told you know Meadows and he seemed unconcerned. Now in my mind, ding, 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 the coup specialist, I'm like, yeah, of course he's unconcerned because the violence was planned. And yeah. the next hearings, we're gonna hear a lot more about this. The violence was, it always had to happen. And so he knew it would happen and he was probably happy that it was going well. So she had a kind of, um, she had a, a, you know, a firsthand eyewitness. Also, she can't be accused of being partisan. She's, she's a staunch Republican. And the, spe the, the, the sight of someone young, uh, you know, a lower civil servant doing their duty and stepping forward, I think was very inspiring to people. And that's why uh, Adam Kinzinger and committee members reported that uh, many other people came forth after they heard her. And that happens it, it, with with these kinds of things. If some people, I think, they're conformists, and then secretly inside themselves, they are perhaps waiting for an opportunity to do the right thing. And it's hard with someone like Trump because he's like a mob boss, and he's he's expert at threatening people, and the threats are real. So there's plenty of reasons not to come forth. And then seeing someone young and fresh who perhaps isn't, doesn't have much power, but is doing the right thing, I think was very compelling. Now you said I, last week on the show or whenever we did the show last, I, I said, I, th I think she was running the whole thing. I think, I think Meadows was in on it, but I also think Meadows is incompetent and a moron and she was really, you know, helpful with the planning. Um, but you mentioned um, when we spoke before and when we emailed earlier that things seem to be accelerating with with the right wing people, the 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 the, the fascists, basically yeah. the American fascists. This because of the of these hearings, everything is, is accelerating. So I think we can all feel it. But what does that mean exactly? And is there a way to quantify it? And what can we look for, you know, in the days, weeks, months ahead here? Well, I think, for example, um, the timing of the Supreme Court um, rulings, uh, which, you know, not only the one on abortion, but uh, the EPA, this kind of aggressive, um, big picture, ramming through things that are clearly against the popular desires and the will of voters, even Republicans. Um, yeah. This is a reaction to. Um, fear that the hearings will bring the house down. And so they're trying to get through everything as fast as possible. Now, in the case of some of the justices, especially, the, the, you know, uh, Justice Thomas, the total self-interest, self-preservation, panic, because, you know, I don't, I don't know if his wife, it, it, Ginny, is going to testify, but she, you know, was outed as being very involved in trying to overthrow the government, which is incredible. Again, this is another, we ha we're faced with all these facts like, okay, Trump was trying to kill Mike Pence. Yeah. That, it, it's unbelievable, right? But it's, it's happened. Um, and then the wife of the Supreme Court justice was involved in a coup conspir conspiracy. So the fact that he comes out with the statement that he wants to look at a ruling, I think the New York Times versus Sullivan, that would make it harder to, it, it, its its existence makes it harder to sue the media for defamation. And he oh, wants a, to review yeah. it. That's that is directly, changer. that's directly, um, uh, that's directly in relation to him being outed as, as, as partisan and his wife, being who knows what will happen, you know, with the investigation with his wife. So, so that that's one symptom of uh, the party and its allies being in emergency mode. And the other thing is that the GOP has been revving up its engines, and I don't even see it as a a party anymore. I see it as an extremist movement, an extremist mm -hmm. force. And the logic of authoritarianism. Look at look at Putin, where you you get you never get less 
radical. You always get more radical and more repressive. But the thing in history that um, fuels an acceleration is if there's an investigation. Um, the first, in fact, the first dictatorship of the 20th century of Mussolini's was he declared dictatorship because he had an investigation that was going to maybe send him to jail. That's why he declared dictatorship. He was a prime minister in a democracy. He was trying to ruin the democracy, doing many things that Trump was doing too. But he, he, the the push to declare to just have a police state was because of a, an, an investigation. So that's, that's why we're seeing this. That dovetails yeah. with my pet theory that Trump really wanted to get a vice president in place so that he could resign and get pardoned, so that he could get out of trouble. Like I think most of what Trump has been doing is for power, but also to avoid prison. So LB, are you ready? Well, Raise your hand yeah. if you're ready. Okay, we're gonna bring LB and, and, and Rosanna back. Okay, here we go. Hi. You're on mute though. You're you, muted. Yeah. There we here you go. There we go. Okay. I heard my boss. I heard Yeah, these Quiet are your themes. <laughs> yeah, no, he this is the only reason to hang on to the presidency was because I think he, I think he's figured out his grift. I think every, every that he doesn't need the presidency for the grift. Um, he's making just a fortune, just raising money and being wild. Um, if he did, because there was great speculation from pr pretty smart and informed people that he was, you know, there could have been a lot of bribes that were being taken from, you know, either through that hotel or just. Who knows? And when he was talking about pallets of money all the time, I was like, who's giving you pallets of money? Is somebody <laughs> cash? Um, you know, certainly certainly helped MBS get out of, um, I don't know, who was, we would be, I guess, the only people giving consequences to that, that bone saw mafia. But um, we didn't. And that was due to, due to Donald and Kushner. So, you know, who knows if there was money there? Who, who knows? Uh, the, he hated that job. But, I mean, it, it was, he hated being in the White House. He hated us. He hated pretending to be an American. He <laughs> hated all yeah, that's, things. That's, that's he really true. did. So it was just power. It was just, I've got power. I, and, and, and he he certainly has a lot of back. He could have left and done his media company and done all that stuff, but he's a criminal. He committed real crimes while in office. You know, I think he just wanted to keep the presidency because it was get out of jail free. That that's right. In fact, um, he he's one of the many authoritarians who run for office while they're under investigation. Yeah. And Putin and Berlusconi and Trump and there are others. And so being what I, and this is uh, one of these things I, I repeat all the time, but it's really important that Trump is different than any other president we've ever had of any party because his goals were totally different. And yeah. it's not about policy. He was there to escape prosecution and turn government into a way to protect himself and his clan and his family. Yeah. And then he was there to make money off of the presidency. Grifted. And that's why he visited. Is this unbelievable? For, until the pandemic shut this down, this grift, this part of the grifting, he spent a third of his time visiting Trump branded properties. So he he was one third of his time because he didn't care about about, as you said, he's, he's not interested in governing. So yeah. the welfare of the population, none of that matters. It's getting rich protecting yourself by having immunity by being in the, and that's why that's yeah. one of the many reasons they can't leave the job and it's easy to predict that he would as i did in my book strongman he wasn't going to leave quietly i didn't know what would happen because i had to turn it in uh, in the summer of 2010 but i knew that he wouldn't leave normally because yeah. they get psychologically and also because then the game is up it's an existential threat to leave yeah so yeah. go ahead and burn it all down. And it doesn't matter if there's carnage and people dying and none of that matters. The threat yeah. was to him that if I'm not in this office and in this position, you know, you could hear it in his pressure and his flailingness in what Cassidy Hutchison yeah. was saying 
and you know, and it does look like he reached for the steering wheel. He was enraged at all that because it's like, oh my God, I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose this, and then they're going to come after me. Um, and yeah, he was. He was. He was on the hook. He's he's really on the hook for vast criminality. I don't know whether we have the balls or the whatever it is. I don't know that that comes from balls, but strength. We have a spine as a nation to um, to charge him. I'm I'm still I, I'm not I'm not saying that it's not going to happen, but I, I I know everybody's like, oh no, we're reading the tea leaves. This is really happening. He's really. Yeah, I don't know, guys. I don't know. What if what if the committee? I th it does look like the committee is going to recommend it, though. I mean, that seems to be. It, but, if know, the committee, if the committee well, recommends it, you know, and Merrick Garland doesn't do it, that's a real fucking problem. Yeah. That that erodes yeah, any because, support that he has. Because the the like it's so important to prosecute for just he's a, he's we all know he's such a dangerous criminal, but also. Um, the only prosecution is important because it's the only thing that starts to puncture their personality cults because yeah. people see that they're not actually infallible. They're not above the law. Right. They can't stand on fifth Avenue and shoot someone and not lose their followers. There are consequences. And so it's really important for the trust of people in politics. And, but you know, people get intimidated. They say, Oh, if we have, if we prosecute him or we do anything, we'll have like civil unrest. And I always say, well, we had January 6th, like he was trying to kill the vice president. Hi. <laughs> I mean, what that's civil unrest. That was so, a lot of unrest. Yeah. It, yeah. It, and it, it, like with Berlusconi. Yeah. yeah. The fear yeah. of what might happen if we do something is going to ensure that you're handing the power over. So yeah, that's great. Right. Is like you don't you don't surrender ahead of time. You don't willfully give up and say because we're afraid of what you might do to us. That's a, because that's, that's the that's abuser. the abuser is winning. The abuser yeah. is winning when you that's do right. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if we if we do that, they might do something really terrible, like radicalize our citizens and arm everybody with AR. <laughs> oh wait, never mind. That's already happening. That's already. Um, okay. We mentioned Ruth. You mentioned. Uh, people running for office while under indictment. And that brings us to Paxton, the attorney general of Texas, which brings us to our fourth topic. Our uh, fourth topic. Laboratory of authoritarianism. What we mean by that, who coined that? Did, who, who, who coined that phrase? Do we know? Oh, so let's, let's let everybody, let's set everybody up here. Hi, Rosanna Arquette. Hi, how are you everybody? <laughs> Here's Rosanna Arquette. And the reason why we sort of all wanted to be together for you guys is because of what's happening with Roe and let you know there's like a little history here between the four of us. So uh, back in, it was September, right? That women's, yeah, there was a women's march. I think it came up, the women's march happened either September, or October, but in September, as everyone remembers, Texas did that law. Greg Abbott did the bounty hunting, right? And then women organized the march, Roe had not been overturned yet. We didn't even know there was a draft majority opinion happening, but you could feel, okay, they're gonna overturn Roe. Like th th this is really happening. So in preparation for that March, Rosanna of course was asked to speak at the March and reached out to me and said, you know, you know, this is what I wanna say and, and really make, take a stand and say, this is about fascism. And so I said, okay, well, let, let's get Ruth on the phone, <laughs> on the Zoom. Um, and yeah, and, and roll through all of this. And then of course we uh, went through it with Greg too, and just sort of worked on this speech to get the thoughts across and you gave the speech and it was, it was incredible, right? It was powerful. It wasn't, we didn't have a huge march. They turned the mic the off. They, yeah, they turned the was, mic off on her. That was <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> there was like a little thing. Um, but so, uh, but it, the idea at the heart of it that we, I want you to be able to talk about it too, of like was um, what came out of it was a statement of Texas being a laboratory that this is, they're experimenting here with American authoritarianism, which is its own becoming its own thing. We're not just copycatting off of other people. We're actually cooking up our own version of authoritarianism that's specific to america and the states are the cooking pots for that we're seeing it state by state yeah. now 
what was just what happened in Tennessee about um, you wrote about that today, Ruth. I you told me um, about them. It's okay to put signs about uh, Jews to, that you know Jews Jews live here. I mean, it's I, just, it's like, I can't it's even. Like Jews Jews work here. This is in Tennessee. This happened. I I, mean? I I I I what, what, what is going on? Yeah. So what do you think, Ruth? What do you think? I think of that. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's well, okay. So one one of the very unfortunate dynamics that's going on um in different states with uh that that brings together the uh Texas uh establishing a bounty for people who help uh people get abortions. That's that Abbott that happened early on with identifying where Jews live with uh, Ron DeSantis, I, AKA the Mussolini of Florida, as I call him, um, having pudgy a tip Mussolini. line. Yeah, see, he's a little pudgy for Mussolini, but maybe. Okay, he's, his, he is one though. He is one. Yeah. Um, he uh, has his office. He has a tip line with his office of election security, which means like election fraud, of course. Um, and that you can you can call and denounce people who are committing election security. What what bring these together is you if you want to have an authoritarian political culture, you've got to uh, not only polarize people, but you've got to make them informers. You've got to yes. incentivize them to turn other people in to spy on people, and so that's one of the things that this is going on in these states, which I'm really concerned about. Um, so that's one. The other is just having every possibility of uh, making it easy for people to commit violence. And so I really am uh, revising the whole framework in which I see gun the whole guns. I think there is this uh, cre concerted effort for years to create the conditions for like low level constant violence that traumatizes people and leads them to uh, over time to want, you know, someone I can fix it you know, the strong man kind of thing, or just be too diseased if you don't, if you, you know, won't take care of uh, disease, of pandemics, too diseased and traumatized and, and full of grief from gun violence to, to care anymore. Um, so there's a lot of things that are going on and the states are, uh, David Pepper, who, you, who used to be the head of the Ohio uh, Democratic Party, he has a really good book called Laboratories of Autocracy. And I interviewed him in my newsletter. And so that's, uh, I, I really learned a lot from him. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm most worried about Abbott and I'm very worried about DeSantis because he's getting huge amounts. So he could be president in 2024. I've already written six articles on him. I'm gonna be on him relentlessly. He's, he's got every uh, quality, in, in, including bullying other people to um, do a huge amount of damage. So, so come on, Joel Greenberg, yeah, do your thing. I'm on this for one second, okay? So I want you to talk about it too, because something that we've talked about a lot, and I give him an idea. Yeah, <laughs> but I think it's <laughs> is the, the there's a turning people in, right, and and incentivizing that, saying here's a bounty, you know, or here here yeah. register and you're part of my little club. And then there's the state itself just rounding up people. Yeah. Is there ever a thing that happens where voices like us don't get rounded up? Yeah. What's the sign that we should look for that the roundup's coming so we can get the fuck out of here before it happens, I guess. But that's right. Happens. Yeah. Uh, we're not getting on the train. I'm sorry. I, I'm, say, I'm saying that as a Yeah, we're not getting. My family who, who was wiped out in Austria, a lot of people were wiped out on Auschwitz and were forced onto that train. We're not getting on that train. We're not going to be forced. And that's, that's the thing that we all have to just say, yeah. we're not getting on the train. It's like, take me out here then. I'm not, I'm not doing this. Yeah. I mean, I'm not gonna yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, like there's going to be more mm -hmm. like in, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, they announced an investigation of the, of the state education system. You know, they're going to, they're trying to like, demonize uh, people. Um, 
I think that what was being set up with Trump at the end and William Barr, who's trying to like totally rehabilitate himself, he was uh, trying to, <clears throat> um, when he, I, I went over the speeches he gave to police and that was when his true like fascist side came out and he was trying to uh, pass legislation or, or do decrees, whatever you do as attorney general to make protesters, for example, uh, be classifiable as terrorists, which is, which is what all you know autocrats do. So, yeah. or for example, I'm on. I was put. Uh, Except for the people that were on January 6th. Sorry, <laughs> they're not. Yes, terrorists. exactly, exactly. Right. Well, there's no, there's no ability for us yeah. to drive our cars into yeah. them, but apparently, you know, this is the problem. Okay. So, so I don't. You know, in terms of rounding up, they're just they're setting the legal basis up. Uh, state by state to have more and more people be considered uh, lawless or be considered uh, to be breaking the law. Um, and that's the that's the background for then, you know, one day being able to put people in jail. I think they set that up for voters. That's what's so scary. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yes. That's um, what 20, 21st century autocrats do, like Orban. They they make these legal frameworks and then and Putin too, then they can get you on anything because it's broad enough that they can apply it the way they need to. Right. Fun times. Um, okay, Ruth, I know you, I know you have a, uh, I know you have a deadline, so we're going to let you go. Thank you so much for uh, coming on and joining us again. For, uh, for every, depressing every, everyone. Oh no. Oh, um, us. You're well, not depressing. The topic is depressing, but it's always nice to see you because honestly it makes, I, I think reading this all the time and stuff, I think it, it is helpful to hear you talk about it. I think it's helpful to talk about it yes. and to review it and make sure that people see that there are people out there who are telling everybody what the deal is and who are experts in fascism and how these right. systems develop and um, that we should listen to you. And it um, makes us feel less crazy. Um, yes, it's that's the other yeah. Thing. It's wild, but has that it's very it's very dark and very depressing. Um, and it it it's I'd rather be standing in the firmament of reality than being in denial about this or being hysterical and paranoid about it. And I don't know how to get any more hysterical. I guess I could run away right now and go and become a survivalist. Uh, but um, it, it's it is very helpful. So it's so appreciative, as always. And what we're gonna let people do, uh, it, so if you backstage wanna hear a little bit of it, uh, we want people to be able to hear this speech because I know you also didn't get a chance to hear Rosanna give the speech. So um, that's what we're gonna, that's what that's we're gonna do now for everyone. That's what we're gonna do. Um, Thank okay, you. so. You're jet lag, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so your sub stack is called Lucid and I wasn't just blowing smoke, it is really good, really professionally done. Oh. You know, calendar regularity of, of posts, always important. You have good people coming on there to do interviews and stuff. And, of course, the book is is a must-read, Strong Men. So, uh, Ruth Benkiat, thanks again for joining us. Have a good night. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. All right. That, do we have any oh, announcements are before we, okay? we get? <laughs> How are we doing? I always mess everybody. Are we okay? No, yeah. We're going to be okay. That's the first thing I said to her before you went on. I mean, I have a couple episodes of Irma Vep left before they run out. So, yeah, really. also, Better Call Saul's coming back on Monday. Oh, so, you know, I just we got that. Class in New York, that was fun. Oh, oh did you? Oh, that's fun. Yeah. All right. Do we have any announcements before we we? Uh, we have we... announcements. I have announcements of anything you want to draw people's attention to? Anything new coming out? Anything? Uh, what do you have going on? Do you have anything? I'm gonna go do a movie with my old friend Griffin Dunn. So that's fun. That's gonna be yeah, fun. That'll be fun. That'll be a good thing. Okay. I don't have anything new that I can talk about yet. I'm okay. sorry, everybody. You know, I'm I not have going as fast as you want me to, but I'm trying. <laughs> I have. Um, I had a good podcast uh, episode today. I think I, ha I had Siobhan Scott, who wrote a book called "The, uh, the Minds of Mass Killers," inside. The Minds of the Mass Killers: uh, Understanding and Interrupting the Pathways to Violence. And she was really good, and she talked about kind of mistakes the media makes and presenting when these killings happen and how, um, you know, it's a situation where people never snap. 
that was one of the takeaways for me. It's not like there's that perception of everything's fine. And one day he just snaps and he goes and gets a gun. And it, that isn't what happens. There's always this sort of long buildup and there's identifiable signs yeah. to how these people get radicalized and, 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 and ossified in their thinking, you know, and there's time to stop them before they do it. And what was particularly interesting, sad, but interesting is that we recorded it after Uvalde, but before Highland Park. So I listened to it, editing it, and listened to her, and everything that she said applied to that guy and, and you know, the, the, the guy in Highland Park. So it's, you know, it, it's always the same, or 99 times out of 100 is the same. So if they're not going to ban the guns, there are things that we can do that are not gun-related that are, it's not really mental health, because another point she makes is that 90% of these killers are, are not actually mentally ill. They're not even really depressed a lot of the time. They just fall into these patterns of yeah. grievance, of extreme grievance and paranoia and other things. Anyway, it's, I, I think it's a particularly good um, exactly. thing to listen to. I don't talk very much, mostly her talking. So I, I feel like I can, I can drum oh, it up. Great. And I thought your write-up, because you always do that uh, prevail yeah. write-up uh, on Friday mornings that, that accompany the, the podcast, I thought that was actually really good today. And you hit that note over and over again they want this they want this they the want lawmakers it. that are standing in the way actually we just have to start talking about it that way we need yeah. to be able to just nail the language around all this stuff so that it lands in in as a truth bomb into the discourse and the truth bomb of that is they want this there's yeah. a lot we can do about it um they or or you can want it to keep going on so yeah yeah that's and they it want is. it all right, we're gonna we're gonna switch chairs here. Let that me... concludes the announcement section of, of, the, uh, of the show. And thank you for all the kind words and the comments, and everything. We're reading the comments. I can't comment back when uh, when I'm on here, but I am reading. It's trying a little to read hard. It. It's a little hard. All right, we're gonna switch seats. We always appreciate you guys uh, chiming in. Um, thank you. All right, I'm excited for this. I haven't heard I haven't heard this in full either. Well, yeah. I'm just reading it live this time. We recorded it a few times. So. We do. We have recordings. Yeah, we have recordings. We have a. a She's a, it. It's right here. I'm gonna pull it up. Pulling it up. Here's the speech, everybody. Here it is. So it happened. Everything we feared. Roe is gone. And what have we learned? that our leaders and our justices lie to us. They are liars and they are thieves. Despite all the promises of protecting Roe v. Wade, our rights are being obliterated. All of our rights are on the line. Democracy itself is at stake. Do not underestimate this moment. The Supreme Court has ensured that our states are now laboratories for American authoritarianism, from the voter suppression laws to the laws that puts their boots on our rooms. We are on the fast track to fascism and its playbook runs right through our bodies. Every woman knows this in our bones those who seek ultimate power of the state have always feared women. Why? Because women are the antidote to the rule of strong men. We have the inherent power of creation. Every person that the strong men seeks to rule over comes from us, from our wombs. Boys, girls, he, she, they, them, we, women, men, all human beings, come from us. To control a woman's body is to control the future. And the fascists cannot afford for us to have that power. So they terrorize us, forcing women to carry and give birth to our rapist babies is an act of terror. Putting bounties on our heads for a medical need is an act of terror. Gaslighting us into believing that women have no right or ability to make decisions over our own bodies is an act of terror. They terrorize us to dominate us, 
to silence us, to wear us down and strip us of our will. No more. No, you will not force us into silence and servitude. Get your boots off our wombs. We, women, are the firewall to the burning destruction of fascism. They want us to be afraid. Do not be afraid. The power we need is in our collective voice. It's in our collective votes. It's in our collective vow to our daughters and to theirs. We will codify our rights into law and make sure no wannabe strongman ever strips them away from us again. We will control our own destinies and those of every citizen facing fascism's grip. And we'll do it by paving and securing the pathways of democracy. We will not be afraid. We will not be silenced. We will not be alone. We have each other and the good men, the allies already at our side. Together, we will continue to raise our children, our votes, and our voices to finally get their boots off our wounds. Yeah. That's good. That was really good. Then, that was really good. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Thank you for I'm stirred. I want to go. Yeah. I want to go out on the street note. now. A little bit of an up note. It's such a, it's such a dark... Oh, it it's a dark time. We, we want to keep, okay. We want to keep everybody focused and present to the moment. We want to be able to process it. We want to be able to dialogue about it. We want to be able to sit in it. We want to also have answers, but we do need to rally one another every now and then. So that's a little rally for the weekend. I like the rally for the weekend. That was really great. Rosanna, thank you so much for for giving for thank for giving you. of yourself. Thanks for all of you for you know Steph and and Ruth and you all coming together and writing it and brilliant writing of Stephanie too. You know everybody. So I think you. I I wrote the jokes that that, that were before the, the actual speech. Did we cut the jokes. The jokes. Yeah. Were good. <laughs> but unfortunately, but I wish we could. I wish this could be funny. I wish we could laugh about this, but we can't. We have to do everything we can to. To make sure that the, our daughters, our daughters are safe. I mean, this is nuts. Yeah. And um, I, I, I think you know we're all feeling the collective rage, sadness, and grief. And now we just have to turn all that all into extreme, you know, power to get to the polls, register people to vote. And I really have to say, I met all these really cool young people this this weekend at a wedding, and like 22 years old, they're motivated. So, you know, it's time to get rid of these old, limp, white men <laughs> in, pa in power, you know, and, yeah. and it's enough and, and, it's and enough. bring in the, you know, youth and the, cause they're the future. And I'm, 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 and I feel really bad that we left this horrible planet for them, <laughs> like in such a state for our, our kids, but they're smarter than us. They are, they're much smarter. They are. Well, that's they good are. to hear. They're on it. And then, Let you the know, young people run, run take, take a run at it. Yeah. Yeah. And support them. We, the we outnumber them also. I mean, I think this is something that's important. It's, it's very easy to feel alone um, when we struggle with this stuff, knowing the stakes and how high they are and how awful things could get. But like, I made a list of, of targets of, of fascists in America, and the targets are women. That's half, more than half the population right there. You know, any minority at all, um, immigrants, um, undocumented people for, who, who come over, gay people, trans people. That's like that's a significant percentage of the population. Yeah, yeah. And there are there are at least eight or nine white guys who are who are on the team, too. So, you know, I can I can assure you. Um, and religious diversity. Right. It, yes. it, it, we're really yeah. being impressed from one particular theology yes. that's been warped and twisted. And it's not even Jesus. It's Jesus that, was about it, love. Jesus was not about hate. I mean, yeah. you know, come on. Yeah. yeah I, I almost, it almost makes me wish that I was religious so he could come back down and be, look at these guys and be like, what, what, what were you thinking? Get, get out, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it, just reading comprehension, maybe not your strong suit. Um, yeah. yeah, it's bad. It's bad. Um, all right. I guess that's our show. That's our Friday night. That's our Friday night. Um, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you for the great comments. Um, 
Thanks, uh, Ruth ben Giat for coming on. Rosanna Arquette, thank you for coming on and giving that outstanding speech and, and inspirational speech. And uh, all right, I'm going to watch Irma Vep. I'll see you guys yeah, later. Yeah, we're going to catch up. We're going to catch up. Bye. Bye, everybody.